why are you being too mean to direct? But just because a person's being too quote unquote mean or too correct, you got to realize this. The Bible shows right here that it doesn't matter about that kind of stuff. What matters is the truth. And when the truth is spoken out, it may come out in a way that may offend you or it's rude. But here's the thing. If you really want the truth that bad, you really want the truth that bad, you won't care how it's decorated or how it's plattered, etc. You won't care for all that kind of stuff. You just want the truth no matter what. So who cares if it's the delivery, the mailman delivery guy, he didn't deliver it to you the way that you wanted it. If you want that package really bad, you'll just take it no matter what. So that's what people got to understand. All right, so we're going to look at 2 Corinthians. And then we're going to look at chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The Apostle Paul, I mean, one of the greatest apostles who ever lived. And the Apostle Paul, you know what he said? He said that, I mean, he wrote a lot of your Christian doctrine. His two epistles, Romans and Galatians, are like the strongest ones against works for salvation. So that Apostle Paul, who's a lot of his teachings we rely upon against the good works crowd. I mean, Martin Luther, he said that his favorite two books were Galatians and Romans. And then concerning the book of James, he says, I would light up my stove with the book of James. Why? Right, because the book of James talked about faith and works. However, the Apostle Paul, we rely on him quite often for our doctrinal teachings. But let's assume that we just didn't like Paul's delivery that he was an offensive and mean guy. Would you listen to him? Would you use those verses, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? Would you use a verse at Romans chapter 10, and Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 11, that shows faith in Christ and then not by works? Hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And notice at verse 1. Verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. All right, so when he gets bold, now watch this. You're going to look now at verse 9. Verse 9. That I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. <laughs> what, Paul? He's scaring them? You shouldn't preach that way. You shouldn't teach that way. I don't like how Pastor Gene Kim calls out this certain wolf right there and this certain false prophet and these preachers right here. I don't like that kind of stuff. Well, you got to realize this is that look at verse 9 for as if I would terrify you by letters and verse 10. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech, what? Contemptible. Contemptible. I mean, look up that word contemptible. Rude. Like almost crude. That's his speech. That's his style of preaching and teaching. Oh, I don't like that. Why? Too much for you? Would you even get saved out of Romans 10.9 then? <laughs> On what he says? Oh, I reject Romans 10.9 for my salvation. Why? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel. Why? Why? Oh, because the guy who wrote that book, his speech is too rude, contemptible. I don't like him. That's how people are. We live, in that, we live in that kind of world nowadays. Look at Matthew 23. Matthew 23. You want me to receive that person as my Lord and Savior, Jesus? Why would you tell me to receive him for my salvation? Oh, because the Bible says so. No, I reject him. Why? He loved you enough to die for you. I mean, it's so simple to get saved. Why don't you get saved right here and right now? No, I reject it. Why? Why, why, why? Oh, because he was mean in his speech. Have you ever heard Christians complaining about Jesus that he was too mean? No, you never heard them, right? Look at Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 23. Start at verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, and then verse 2, blah, 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 all the way down to the end of verse 39, right? Verse 39. It just goes blah, 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 blah. And don't worry, I'm not going to touch on 24. <laughs> so notice right here in Matthew chapter 23 right here. So notice he was, uh, Jesus Christ was preaching a long message. And do you think he was in a happy, lovey-dovey mood during this? No, he, he was very, I'm going to tell you something. I think he was very angry. <laughs> Look at right here, verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
for ye devour widows' houses, for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the what? Greater damnations. All right. If I were to preach the gospel on the streets and I were to say, you snakes are going to hell, you might go, whoa, pastor, you got to be careful of that, right? And I would agree about that one. I would agree about that. Because Paul said you have to be wise in giving the gospel. However, you'll notice that in preaching, it doesn't have to meet to people's needs. <laughs> because Jesus did, did call them snakes. I mean, look at right here, Matthew chapter 23. And then, man, Jesus Christ, he's just slapping them all over the floor at verse 33. Verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generations of vipers, how can he escape the damnation of hell? And guess who he was speaking that to? He was speaking that to pastors, to religious leaders, false religious leaders. Look at that. So, you know, if I name out a certain false prophet here and there, a certain false pastor right here and there, and then, you know, I say, you know, oh, that person's lost, he's not saved, that person's going to hell, and let's say that person's testimony is showing genuinely that he did not receive Jesus Christ for his or her salvation, and then people get upset and say, oh, how can you say that that person's lost and that person's going to hell? You would do the same thing with Jesus then, because he choked out their religious pastor right here. Now look at Matthew chapter 23 again, Matthew chapter 23, and look at verse 15. One to you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, for he compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, look at this, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. <laughs> Update that in modern English. How will that sound? <laughs> really crude, don't you think? Your, your savior, I mean, you don't want to, I'll tell you one thing, you don't want to tick your Savior off. Look at verse 24. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. <laughs> yeah, he meant that. <laughs> wow, right? Jesus really said that? Yeah, he really said that. <laughs> Believe it or not. Believe it or not. Wow. Amazing, right? It, things just keep getting better and better. Go to Nehemiah 13. <laughs> things just keep getting better and better. <laughs> Look at Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah 13. We're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 13. And then we'll look at verse 25. Nehemiah chapter 13. And we'll look at verse 25. So chapter 23, I'll just say the whole chapter right here, all right? So the whole chapter. So you notice right here, speech contemptible. So speech is rude. All right, so bookmark this stuff about Pastor Gene Kim, and let's see if it matches with the Bible, okay? So speech rude. Matthew 23, you notice that Jesus Christ, he did, he did name calling. And then he used really strong phrases. <laughs> He called Herod the fox, you got to understand. He even said one time uh, that you're worthless more than a, a heap of dunghill. He even said that somewhere at the book of Luke. Now, update that in your modern English. How will that sound? <laughs> Look at Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 25. And I contended with them. So Nehemiah, their pastor, contended and what? Cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair. <laughs> made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. What in the world, man? <laughs> what in the world? Why would Nehemiah do that kind of stuff? <laughs> so look at that. So he's like plucking off their, uh, their beard, hitting them, preaching at them very hard. I mean, uh, my goodness. I'll just put blank right here, shall we? It's just too strong that I'll just put blank right here. Imagine having that as your pastor. Now we're going to look at another passage. Go to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings. You, you, you see these prophets and these preachers in the Bible, they really acted like today's preachers, don't they? They really act like that, don't they? My goodness, look at 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. 
Now, let's see right here. I don't like it when pastor is sarcastic. I don't like it when he makes fun of people and he, he just acts all funny when it shouldn't be funny. He's a man of God. How dare you? You know. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Look at verse 26. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. Oh my goodness. How about that? Now, let's say that there were these people who were doing a religious ritual, and they were actually cutting themselves. I, your pastor would have no heart whatsoever to make fun of them. But Elijah did. Look at verse 28. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. What in the world? What in the world? So we see right here that at 1 Kings chapter 18, and then we saw in these couple of verses where the prophet Elijah, he mocked them. Now, the thing is this, there's a time and place for everything. D did you see, here's the easy answer, okay, to understand about this. If I do this 24-7, I'm going to tell you something, I don't care who you are, you're not a good pastor, and you're not a good Christian, period. There's a time and place for everything. Because use some common sense, people. If Jesus and Elijah and Nehemiah was like this 24-7, don't you think you would have known about that? <laughs> yeah, you would have known about that. The reason why you don't know, you wouldn't know about that is because it's rarely mentioned. It's only mentioned a few times. So the thing is this, is that you got to realize there's a time and place for everything. So you got to realize is there are some people out there who don't know any better, who don't know any better. So let's say that they believe in a wrong doctrine. Let's say that they believe in a wrong doctrine. Let's say replacement theology, or let's say the post-tribulation rapture, or covenant theology, et cetera, et cetera. If they believe in that kind of stuff, then what do I do? I show them in love what's wrong with that one. But then what happens is that when there are these pastors out there who know better, and these people, not just pastors, but regular members who know, who've been given the truth and should know better, and they're causing problems, then you know what I'm going to do? Yeah, you betcha, I'm not going to treat them nice. I'm going to be strict. I'm going to even kick them out. I'm going to rebuke them, and I have zero respect because that person's heart Amen. already sold in making a decision in not getting right with God. Other people, I mean, you saw your pastor, right, in street preaching, soul winning, and you even saw your pastor trying to calm you down a bit too, right? So look, I know about self-control. I know about this kind of stuff. There's a time and place for everything. When you give the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is not a time where you act like an idiot or a jerk. Amen. These are people dying and going to hell, and they don't know any better. So you want to show them what is right from the word of God and try to get those poor souls saved. That includes the demented liberals and then the atheist people who are doing sex party, the sodomites, and all those kind of people. I mean, why would you deliberately target those kind of events? There's so many people outside of our world who are dying and going to hell. So reach those people, get them saved. And then, I mean, it's a blessing, right? Haven't we seen liberals receiving Jesus Christ? Haven't we seen sodomites receiving Jesus Christ for their salvation? I mean, it's a blessing right there. So here's the thing, is that you got to realize a time and a place for everything. There's a time and a place for everything. If a person eats so... Why would I use sarcasm at times? Name calling, strong phrases, speech and rude, and I don't think I'm going to do this one. <laughs> That's why it's blankety blank. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do that one. But why would I do these things at times? The reason why is the time and place that your pastor will do it is when some wolf out there is gnawing at some sheep and trying to steal some sheep from that church and poison some sheep in the church. Amen. And then some false prophet, some false pastor out there that posting gazillion stuff online that people are just going, what in the world anymore? Those kind of people, I will use this kind of stuff and rebuke them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Some of you have tried to use love, haven't you, with some of your previous pastors or church members in the uh, wrong churches you came from? Did they listen? No, they didn't listen. So the point is this. The point is you got to understand people are people. Oh, they'll eventually understand. They'll eventually get saved. Look, you pray long enough. You love them long enough. You talk to them long enough. Trust me, if you've done that for years and years and years and years and they don't, they don't get right with God, and then you say, oh, but then when you start using these things, you'll chase them away. No, they never want to get saved to begin with. They never want to receive the truth to begin with. So sorry, I'm going to keep doing this, bless God. I'm going to keep doing that. At every tale out there who is trying to hurt people's souls out there, I'm going to be doing that. So it's important to understand that in our Bible, that there's a time and place for everything. Because here's the thing that you got to understand about the Lord Jesus Christ. Has he, not, has he not, at Matthew 23, condemned them and judged them, but then he even died for those people and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Those are people who don't know any better. And tr trust me, if you are in that sodomite shoe where you're probably molested at some young age or somebody out there, and you are over there out there, and then uh, you grew up in that kind of a messed up background, and then all the schools you can go to was not in a Christian home or a Christian school, but it was a public school, and now that they've been brainwashed ever since they were a young child, and then they did sodomite actions that were just heinous and wicked out there, and they grow up lost and condemned without God. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The thing is, is that when you give the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and when you pray for those lost souls, you got to realize this, you could have been one of them. You could have been one of them. So be careful with that attitude of yours that, oh, you know, I'm not going to witness to this atheist. I'm not going to lead that sodomite to salvation. I'm not going to do that. They're hopeless. They're gone. And you better watch that kind of heart, that attitude of yours. You could have been one of them. You could have been one of them going to hell, burning right now without Jesus Christ. So you know what? Yeah, I will do this at times, but you got to realize this. Just like Jesus Christ died for them, I mean, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I want to give my life for those souls out there and see them open their eyes to the truth, receive Jesus Christ. That's why I came to this place. I, mean, I could have gone to different places. I, I, I don't like this area. I still don't like this area. I mean, very liberal community. But you know why I stay here? I really care for people out there. I really care for you who came to church today. And you know, whenever there were times that I could have, uh, that I felt like quitting or closing the door, I remember those sheep who came in, the person who I led to Jesus Christ. And because of that, I said, I'll stick here a little longer, Lord. And then I might just bump somebody out of nowhere and then just discover the fruit like that, which I had no idea all this time. 